Good day. This is a recording about the TBA that is to be arranged study that is part of the biology classes. This is a required project that's an additional 16 hours to be arranged. That's where it gets its name. And it's up to the instructor to set up a particular study for each uh, class. So I've chosen a study on the common raven as our project that we're going to do in our classes. So why did I pick this particular study? Why don't you read this slide um, while I'm giving you my rationale. First, I wanted to pick a study where students could do some real science and in a way that didn't require special equipment, special visits to places. And but was appropriate, a, a, study met, a study subject that was appropriate to do in San Mateo County and where most of you as students work, live, study, or travel to. I chose the common raven because you can identify ravens without binoculars and you can do the study without special equipment. So we're looking at common ravens and we're also looking at other birds as the main study subjects that we're going to measure or count. The other reason is that ravens are very common and easily found in our county and they associate with a lot of urbanized areas and there's some interesting biology that we can may possibly uncover by doing this study. Many of you have read the chapters on the scientific method by now, so we're going to review this a little bit. There are two approaches used in biology, discovery science and hypothesis-based science. So I set up this study so it's a combination of both and we can take either an observation approach or a hypothesis-based approach when we actually start uh, looking at the data that we collect at the end of the semester. So let's look at our study subject here. This is the common raven. The first thing you're going to have to do is learn how to identify them. And again, I picked this subject because these guys are hard to miss. Um, they have a massive size. They're around 30 inches. So get a ruler out and see how big that actually is. They have a, a quite a long, thick beak that is pretty easy to identify. Um, you can see from the throat here, it has sort of shaggy throat feathers that, you know, especially if there's a little wind blowing or they're moving around, is, is pretty easy to see. And they have a qu quite a long tail. You can see how the, lail, the tail extends past the wings fold, folded here. And it looks like it has a kind of a boat shape. And you can see that um, when they're uh, perching like this. And you can also see that in flight. So let's talk about the study method for a bit. On the website, you'll find a table that you can download. It's a Word file. I suggest this, but you don't have to do it exactly this way. But I suggest that you print this and you keep it handy. You can keep it in your backpack or keep it in your car. And you're want, going to want to fill this out when you're in the field, when you're doing your surveys. So, the, so, so that's the first step. Then identify sites for study. One of the reasons why I picked this particular study method was you can do this anywhere. You can do it in your home. You can do it at your work. You can do it on campus. You can do it in neighborhoods around where you go and travel. If you go walk um, in a park, you can do it in a park. You can do this everywhere. So identify sites that you want to study, and that's where you'll do your counts. You don't have to have lots of sites. You can have a few, and then you can do multiple census um, counts at the same places. I do recommend that you spot for ravens and try to find places where you can observe ravens and do the study, just so you get the experience of that. It would be a, rather boring if you 
picked a spot and they never saw anything. Once you've identified your sites, you will identify a time and then you're going to conduct a five minute survey. It's called a plate census. So you'll need to time it with your device. Most of you have mobile devices. Um, so you want to count for five minutes. You're going to count ravens and then you're going to count other birds. That you do not have to identify the species of other birds that you see. You're not going to want to count very large birds, such as raptors, that's hawks, vultures, or crows. And I'll give you some more tips in later slides about that. So you'll fill out this form. You'll indicate the date, the starting time. You're going to identify latitude and longitude, and I'm going to show you how to do that in later slides. You'll count the number of ravens. You'll count the number of other birds that you see. We're just using songbirds as a general term. And then you're going to want to indicate you know, what the weather is, what kind of environment you're in, how much cover it is. Is it dense forest? Is it landscape trees in an urban setting? Is it shrubs? Is it open country? And so forth. So you're going to record the date and time, record decimal degrees. I'm going to explain what that is, but that's a particular way of showing latitude and longitude that you can get off the internet through Google Earth or you can get it off your devices even. Um, note the weather. You can identify a code for the weather in your cover, your descriptive information, or you can just use a few words to describe that. To get your latitude and longitude, you use an app that you have available. There's many of them. Or you can download Google Earth to identify your location. Also, you're going to record field notes, not on this table, but on a separate page. I want you to stay at least five minutes after you do your count and just observe. Write down everything you see about the environment, about what the birds are doing, and so on. Now, there is a point I want to make here. It's in your guidelines, but you only count birds, ravens and birds that you see. You will probably hear lots of bird calling in bird chatter. You can use that as a way to look in that direction and see if you see birds. But don't count birds that you do not see. That throws off the results. So let's take a look at the birds. These are the other birds that I do not want you to count. Generally, these are birds that are larger birds that are relative the same size or the same uh, uh, predator status as the ravens. Um, so I'll talk about these counterclockwise just to give you a, a feel for it. All right. So you don't want to record large soaring hawks that you may see. You can write them in your field notes if you see them. You may even see interactions between some of these birds and the ravens. But don't include them in the count. So this is a red-tailed hawk at the top left, a red-shouldered hawk going counterclockwise, crows, which are closely related to ravens, but they're different. And I'm going to talk about how to distinguish the, between them, because you can see they look quite similar to the ravens. Um, if you're on the shoreline or in some urban areas, you'll also see gulls. So don't count gulls. And don't count turkey vultures. You'll see those soaring overhead. Like I said, include them in your field notes, but don't include them in the count. So let's look at ravens versus crows for a minute, because you will see um, ravens and crows together sometimes in the same places. So we generally have talked about how you identify the raven, but I'm going to compare and contrast the two. So first of all, the size is quite different. The largest crow is smaller than the smallest raven. So 16 to 21 inches in length, 22 to 30 inches in length for ravens. From a distance, it may be a little difficult to distinguish the sizes of these birds. So when in doubt, don't count. Um, so the crows have a less heavier beak 
than the um, ravens. So take a look at the difference between the two beaks. They both look heavy, but you can see the raven has a longer beak and it's, it is slightly heavier than the crow. The crow has smooth throat feathers. So look at the throat. See how the throat goes in as if there's no, I guess, equivalent in humans, Adam's apple. Whereas the raven has some shaggy throat feathers that make the throat stick out. The other uh, major clue is look at the crow wings folded over the tail. Almost The wings are almost the same length when folded as the tail is. So the shorter wings of the crow almost covers the tail. And see how the tail sticks out with the raven? And then lastly, you can look at how many of these you're seeing. Crows usually are in fairly large flocks, at least three, if not more than three. So if you see a large a flock of, of these birds, take a look. They're probably crows. Ravens are rarely in large flocks. They're usually in pairs, singles pairs. You know, occasionally you'll see three. You know, on the coast I've seen four, but um, they're generally, if, if you see more than four, take another look. Chances are they're not ravens. The other thing that you can do is look at, is examine the calls. So I've given you a website here that you can go to and you can play audio of ravens versus crows. So that's sometimes helpful. The raven has a really deep calling sound compared to a, a, a crow. When you hear the, the caw, 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 that's probably a crow. The raven, it's a much more guttural, deeper sound, almost like a wretch. <laughs> it's the best way I can describe it. And I can't really duplicate it very well with my voice. All right, some other data collection tips. Try not to bunch up your data. Um, please don't wait till the very end of the time when the data collection is due and take all your samples then. We're going to get very bunched up and skewed data if we do that. So start now. Print that sheet out, stick it in your car or your backpack, and start looking around. You may want to do some test census before you actually start recording, just to get a feel for things. Um, again, Scout for Ravens is a place to collect data. They're, once you learn to spot them, they're pretty easy to spot. and You can find lots of places around the county of San Mateo where you can um, identify them. Note that this study is confined to San Mateo County. So I put a note for my online students that if you are not a resident of the county and you don't intend to travel to the county, I'm going to come up with an alternative uh, method for you. But you know, if you uh, travel to the county, take the opportunity for those times to do your surveys. You know, keep your forms handy and take the census when the opportunity arises. It is OK not to see ravens on a particular census. So let's say that you spot a raven and you decide you're going to go there at 2 o'clock and do your survey. There may not be ravens at the time you do that census. Just collect the data anyway. Um, it is OK if you choose some sites that are more remote, like parks, where you might not likely see ravens. So that's OK, too. So this is a just a quick view of some of the common birds that you might see, the types of birds that you will count as, quote, songbirds or other birds. I'm going to kind of go counterclockwise again here. So on the top left, you see a couple of types of finches. We have goldfinches, a couple of different species, and we have house finches, purple finches that look similar to this house finch. So you'll see those kinds of birds quite uh, commonly. Kind of dipping to the middle here, there's two types of blue birds you're going to see. Those are blue jays. We have a scrub jay with the long tail here and a stellar's jay with kind of that, um, that uh, black crown on the top. So you'll see those are quite common species that you're going to want to count. Those are the blue jays. 
robins that you may already be familiar with. The robins have arrived in San Mateo County. I've been seeing them. They're migratory, so they've kind of set up their uh, spring summer uh, territory. So you'll see robins. Blackbirds, this is the brewer's blackbird. This is the blackbird that you see kind of swooping around a lot of our urban centers, particularly if there are street trees. These are the birds that you've probably seen YouTube videos dive bombing when they're nesting. They're very aggressive about protecting their nests. Um, morning dove going below. Um, the morning dove is technically not a songbird from a taxonomic point of view, but it's part of our study. We want to count them. Then uh, you'll see um, a number of other birds. This is just kind of an example of a flycatcher type of bird. This is a um, black phoebe. Um, so you'll see these different uh, birds. Often you'll see them kind of fluttering around, and they're actually catching insects on the fly. That's where they get their name. If you do do some surveys on the coast of our county, you'll see shorebirds. So you do want to count those. Not the big gulls, but the little shorebirds that you see. This is an example of a sanderling, which is a shorebird that you might find on the beaches. And also, you might find this last couple, these last few birds. This is a swallow perched on this barbed wire here. Um, if you're surveying kind of near um, overpasses or uh, creeks and things, you might see these, these barn swallows. There are other types of swallows, bank swallows, that also inhabit um, these places. And uh, then you'll see some tiny birds going back around up to the top below the finches. Uh, bush tits are an example. You'll see uh, wren tits, uh, wrens, little birds like that. Um, and you'll also see hummingbirds. So you want to count all these kinds of birds. Um, again, you want to count birds that you see and not birds that you hear. So let's look at the latitude and longitude um, issue here. I recommend that you download Google Earth. It's free. It's kind of fun to play with. Um, and you can use Google Earth to determine where you are, to record your latitude and longitude data on your sheets. So download Google Earth. Then you can pretty easily determine where you are by keying in an address in the search window that you see at the top left or a name of a park or a name of a, of, of a location like College of San Mateo. Um, Google Earth will zoom in to where you are, and then you can look at the aerial and, and pretty much pin where you are exactly. You can get right to the parking lot or the particular tree that you're next to. It's fairly easy to do. Um, what you're going to want to do if you use Google Earth is to set Google Earth in the beginning using the, the, um, the Tools menu, and then look at the View tab. You want to set it to decimal degrees. The reason why we use decimal degrees is that you can um, actually take that and you can put it in other geographical displays. Um, and easily have your data displayed. So I want to actually have all the data in decimal degrees going forward with the classes in the different semesters. Um, once you do that, then Google Earth at the bottom here, and you can kind of see it right above the, the, the computer um, shortcut bar, it'll display where you are in decimal degrees, OK? Now, if you don't, if you have a mobile app and you're using that to collect information, chances are it'll give you degrees, minutes, and seconds. There are lots of free converters that you can get that you actually plug that data in, and it'll convert it to decimal degrees for you. So depending on how you're collecting your data, there's a bunch of different options that, that you can use. 
What I want is when you turn in your data on the forms, I would like it in decimal degrees. So you're going to want to do the conversion. So here's, here's an example of a, an actual data point that I took where I, measure, I count, did a count and then I used Google Earth to pin my location. So you see the little pin mark there. And I set Google Earth to show me decimal degrees. So when you actually uh, click on that Pin, you can do kind of a right click and select place mark. It'll tell you your actual decimal degrees where you are. The other thing you can do is you can use the file menu and you can save these images when you're uh, collecting your data so that you know exactly where you are. And um, that helps me at the end proof that, you know, where you were and you know, we can also analyze these aerial photos if we choose to do that. So that's a quick introduction to Google Earth. If, you know, a lot of you have mobile devices and you're pretty app savvy, so there might be other options available to you. So let me just review about the data packet part. So you're going to turn in your field forms or a copy of your field forms. Online students can either enter all the data in that form electronically and upload it, or you can scan the uh, form, the handwritten form, and convert it to PDF and get it to me that way. Whether you're an in-class student or, or an online student, I will accept handed in packets if you can get them to me. Okay, your due date is different depending on your class, so check your due date. It's fairly late in the semester. End of March is the earliest one, and we get a kick into April for some of the other classes. So your complete data packet includes the field form that I showed you, filled out, um, your field notes that I told you to record, and the maps of where of your locations. So again, you can use Google. Google Earth, I'm sorry, it says Google Docs. You can use Google Earth. You can use Google Maps if you use the satellite images rather than the street view images. Um, so there's lots of different ways to, to do this. Um, I'll, when the, after the data packets are due, what I would like to do is set up group sessions either online or in class to cross-check your data before you hand them in. And then ultimately, part of the data packet is to enter the form data onto a spreadsheet template. Then I can combine all the spreadsheets, and then we, using Excel, we can actually generate some graphics when we're actually writing up the final results of this project. So in class and online, I'll when the written assignments are due, I'll be giving you detailed information of how to do those. Um, the guidelines are available on the website that give you instructions for each assignment. But what I want to do here is just connect the written part with the data collection part. The written assignments are designed to provide background research on the study that you will use as we build towards the final write-up of the project. So the idea is that there are two small, relatively small written assignments that you'll then use to compile your final project. So you're kind of getting the background work done. So by the time we get to the final project, you've, you've written most of it. Um, it also exposes you to research skills using scholarly journal articles. So the written assignments build on the final project. So you'll have you'll do your data collection and you'll start working on your final project essentially with your small written assignments. So by the time we get to the final project, you've got your research sort of written up, you'll collect your data, and then so we can build a final report that is almost three quarters complete by the time we get there. So that's kind of the idea of this. I hope you really enjoy this project. I think it's I've done this for 
a number of semesters. Um, we've been working on the Raven project. This will be our second semester doing it. And I think this gives you an example of uh, what uh, real science can actually be about. I will say that it's kind of risky. You know, we don't know what kind of data we're going to get. We don't know how good that data is going to be. But that's part of the fun of it. Please feel free to contact me if you have any more questions.